Buildings, air conditioners, refrigerators are all part of our everyday lives. What do they have in common? Man-made chemicals called hydrochlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs. Used since the 1940s in the refrigeration sector, they can also be found in the air conditioning, foam, and fire extinguishing sectors, where they replaced ozone-depleting substances controlled by the Montreal Protocol. HCFCs are less damaging to the ozone layer, but what about their impact on climate? This became a key concern in the Montreal Protocol's policy debate. 2007 was a crucial year in the history of the Montreal Protocol. The parties, actually the governments of the world, decided to adjust and strengthen the protocol to advance, to accelerate the phase-out of HCFCs. We took a decision that both the developed countries and the developing should, when they were converting from HCFCs away to other alternatives, look at climate. We use a term called global warming potential, GWP, to estimate the impact of a particular mass, let's say a kilogram of a chemical, for example, versus the impact of CO2 on climate change. It turns out many developed countries have already phased out virtually all of their consumption and production of HCFCs, and others are on track to do so by the agreed target of 2020. Developed countries had done quite a lot already, and often by not going to low GWP alternatives. The developing countries at that stage had actually still the freedom to make selections taking climate into a full account. A challenging timeline was designed by which HCFC consumption levels in developing countries will be reduced in a stepwise manner until they are completely eliminated by 2030. So it is the developing countries that have the freedom to go further, to look into new technologies, technologies with high quality, high energy efficiency that are also environmentally and economically viable. With financial assistance and technology transfer facilitated by the Montreal Protocol's multilateral fund, developing countries are already taking on this challenge, thus paving the way for the adoption of ozone and climate-friendly alternatives to HCFCs. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol created a framework within which the phase-out of commonly used ozone-depleting chemicals would succeed in protecting the ozone layer. We have managed to phase out 98% of the ozone-depleting substances that we have saved also over 25 billion CO2 equivalent gases and something that perhaps was not even on the minds of those who designed the Montreal Protocol. So CFCs are a real important ozone-depleting substance. We've reduced their emissions. We've removed also a threat to climate change. Enter HCFCs. These substances have a much lower impact on ozone depletion, but they are still depleting the ozone layer. In the meantime, they also have a much lower, but still substantial impact on climate change. In developing countries, we've seen an enormous growth of HCFC production and consumption. All these HCFCs have to be converted again to other alternatives. Those conversions that took place in the developed countries were mostly influenced by the global market. And that means for refrigeration and air conditioning, developing countries also choose high GWP HFCs. HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, they are ozone friendly. That's great. Well, as it turns out, the current mix of HFCs that we use now in industry has a global warming potential of roughly 1,500 times CO2. In a way, we're helping to solve the depletion of the ozone layer, but we are actually contributing to global warming. If we want to gain the climate benefits that we could potentially gain by phasing out HCFCs, then we have to make some choices right now. At this point, what are we going to substitute HCFCs for? There's not at all a one-size-fits-all alternative. We have a number of alternatives for a number of subsectors with a low or no ozone depletion impact and a low or no climate impact. These alternatives include fluorine-free substances such as hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide, water and ammonia, low GWP HFCs, and not in-kind solutions. Even though the refrigeration and air conditioning sectors account for the majority of HCFC consumption, 
Current alternatives tend to be more mature and available in the foam sector. Foam is, is a very useful, widely used material. You encounter foam every day of your life. And there are two main types of foams. There's flexible foams, which are used in mattresses. You slept on one last night. Uh, used for sofas. And then there are rigid foams, mainly used in insulation of houses and other buildings, uh, insulation of refrigerators. As energy efficiency standards become more rigorous, the amount of insulation used in homes has increased. This has led to a rise of global HFC consumption. It's important to realize HFCs, they give the foam very good energy efficiency, but they have the drawback of a high GWP. HFCs have been the main replacement option to HCFCs in the building and construction foam sectors of developed countries. But this has not always been the case. For example, in the EU, uh, companies transitioned from HCFCs to pentanes in the building construction sector. Pentane is just one example of available low global warming potential alternatives, but there are more. We have hydrocarbons, cyclopentane and pentane. We have CO2 water, which is used sometimes in articles such as vending machines. Liquid CO2 is a technology that is used in making things like mattresses, unsaturated HFCs, and uh, methyl -al, which is being used now for the first time in, in products. We have in foams technologies available for many, virtually all developing countries, to make a first 10 or 20 percent reduction step. So what you see in many developing countries where they have to design their first steps towards a reduction of their dependence on HCFCs, they will focus on foes. Technology options exist, but there are barriers that need to be addressed to fully achieve environmental benefits. Cost implication is one of them. Low GWP alternatives can have lower operating and incremental capital costs in some cases, and be economically less attractive in others. The challenge is real, but a number of foam sector projects are showing us the way. With support by the Montreal Protocol's Multilateral Fund, a transition from HCFCs to low GWP and energy efficient alternatives has already started worldwide. We established a partnership through the Multilateral Fund that has over the years expended over $2.8 billion in introducing new technologies, phasing out processes, capacity building, training and awareness, and essentially has enabled the Montreal Protocol to work as a global coalition of partners bringing different competences and resources to the problem. In Swaziland, HCFC 141B was used as a blowing agent by the fridge company Palfridge. They decided to convert their entire production line to cyclopentane, which was not available locally. This also meant redesigning the entire production line and answering safety concerns. This was made possible through technology supported by the United Nations Development Program, the German agency GIZ, staff training, and assistance for the safe design of new models. The emission of thousands of tons of CO2 has been avoided. Service quality and product sales have increased, large energy and resource savings have been made, and new jobs have been created for technicians and suppliers in a country that has one of the world's highest unemployment rates. As a consequence, the company's market position has improved, and a number of other companies in the region, such as manufacturers in South Africa, have already indicated their interest to follow this example. This project demonstrates technical and economic feasibility of hydrocarbon-based technology in medium-sized fridge manufacturers. In Croatia, a change in the country's legislation led to the adoption of water-based technology by the Polymix company. However, there was a broad absence of technical information regarding this alternative, the capacity of the existing manufacturing equipment was not appropriate, and the molding of the polyurethane foam became more complex. Financial support from Italy through the Multilateral Fund and technical guidance from the United Nations Industrial Development Organization enabled the purchase of a new, higher capacity manufacturing line, while in-house research provided adequate technical solutions. Furthermore, new water-based formulations became available on the European market. The emission of tons of CO2 has been avoided, product quality has improved, overall production has doubled, and exports continue to grow daily. In China, the growing economy and the associated construction boom have led to a sudden increase in the use of extruded polystyrene foam insulation. A pilot project was developed to demonstrate the use of CO2 as a blowing agent in Beipeng's production line. 
Beipeng had no experience with CO2 and ethanol. Capacity building was needed to meet quality requirements and the appropriate handling of equipment by the workers. The German agency GIZ provided technical support through regular visits from experts. Specific training was organized to operate equipment and choose the right mix of chemicals. By improving the quality of its products, the company gained a competitive advantage on the market. Better insulation materials also means a reduction of energy consumption in heating and cooling of buildings. 1.6 million tons of CO2 emissions have been avoided per year. The choice of technology for replacing HCFC 141B in small and medium-sized enterprises has often been high GWP HFCs. In Brazil, a pilot project has been designed by the United Nations Development Program around Arinos Química to validate the use of methylal as the blowing agent in the manufacturing of polyurethane. The assessment had to address a number of barriers, make sure that the use of methylal did not create incremental health concerns, that an acceptable range in the foam stability and density was met, that the material was commercially available, and that the conversion cost wouldn't be too high. Safe practices have been developed to determine the extent to which methylal could be used without causing unexpected setbacks in other HCFC phase-out projects. Technology transfer was received through inputs from Lambiat and Company in Belgium, a major supplier of methylal. The pilot project not only confirmed that methylal could be successfully used as an alternative in the manufacture of polyurethane, it has also allowed Arinos to improve the quality of its products in a cost-effective way while securing safe production conditions. Barriers to the uptake of low GWP technologies can be overcome through a number of actions. Countries can take part in this transition through the upgrade of national regulations and the setup of standards and norms to promote these alternatives. Knowledge is there and there's a, luckily there's a lot of experience around the world uh, in terms of uh, the foam technicians in how to phase out HCFCs. I also have a very high level of confidence in, in industry in responding to the challenge. Industry is still looking for technical feasible alternatives in certain type of applications such as spray foams. As we speak, liquid CO2 is being tried in a pilot project in Colombia. At the same time, technology providers are constantly working on long-term, low GWP alternatives in the refrigeration and air conditioning sector. And so research and development goes on. The refining of the technology goes on. Things are evolving. Everything is evolving. Nothing in the world of competition, nothing stands where it is. Low GWP in refrigeration and air conditioning, they are evolving. Not only do these evolutions benefit the climate, but they also improve people's well-being. In Kenya, an ozone and climate-friendly technology called solar chill is using the power of the sun to save human lives. These solar fridges use hydrocarbons in the refrigerant cycle and the insulation foam. They help deliver vaccines and refrigeration to remote areas that lack access to electricity, illustrating how the adoption of new technologies can power sustainable energy for all. When countries take advantage of new technologies that have become available, then truly we can reverse some of the phenomena that have become so prevalent throughout the 20th century, namely the footprint of human and industrial activity affecting the health of our planet. Let's make sure that we're taking steps in all positive directions, not just out of convenience, but that we don't end up creating impacts that will come back to haunt us later. All the actors in the Montreal Protocol family, the implementing agencies, the ozone secretariat, the fund secretariat, and in particular, the countries must act now. We have the power to make positive choices. Technologies are there and evolving every day. So let's keep on track to help close the climate gap and protect the ozone layer for now and the future.